Good evening. Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the corridors of mystery are going to take us back to 1938 for a 20th Century Fox movie entitled Time Out for Murder. This is the first of three films in the Roving Reporter series. The heroes of the Roving Reporter series are reporter Barney Callahan and his photographer Snapper. Tonight, a bank messenger is arrested for murdering a client. But Barney and Snapper team up with an attractive female bill collector trying to prove him innocent. They suspect known gangster Dutch Moran did the murder and they're out to prove it. But they only succeed in proving that he couldn't have done it. So who did? Michael Whalen plays reporter Barney Callahan and Chick Chandler plays photographer Snapper. And neither of these actors had a distinguished career, but the people in the supporting cast certainly did. And let's start with Gloria Stewart. And she plays the bill collector Margie Ross. Her career lasted 59 years after she made this movie. And this wasn't nearly her first one. Her last role was in 1997 when she played the old lady who drops the necklace into the sea at the end of the movie Titanic. Jean Rogers plays Helen Thomas. Her short career was noteworthy for playing Dale Arden in the first two Flash Gordon series. Robert Collard played in almost everything. He was in dozens of films, including three Stooges comedies, several serials, and he was just fed up with uh, Hollywood at the age of 36, and in 1951 he retired from acting. The most impressive supporting actor tonight, though, is Douglas Fowley, and he plays Dutch Moran. He appeared in over 240 films, dozens of TV shows, and he died in 1998 at the ripe old age of 86, and he attributed his long life to having married seven women and not keeping any of them around for more than just a few years. The Roving Reporters were surprisingly low-budget productions for 20th Century Fox, whose B-movies were generally a cut above the B-movies of most of the other studios. But in spite of the budgets, these storylines are pretty darn good. So let's return to 1938 and join the Roving Reporters. Let's take a time out for murder. Time, please. You can get the correct time by dialing Meridian 71212. Oh, thank you. M E 71212. When you hear the signal, the time will be 11:51 and 3 quarters. M E 71212. When you hear the signal, the time will be... <laughs> Too much noise! I can't hear you! What did you say? But I tell you, this baby is different. She gave me a telephone number. Sure, nickel. Meridian 71212. You'll see, wise guy. When you hear the signal, the time will be 1218 and one half. When you hear the signal, the time will be 12, 18, and one half. When you hear the signal, the time will be 1, 19, and one quarter. Johnny. How many times must I tell you not to bother Helen when she's on duty? I know, but gee, the bank sent me on an errand and I was just passing by. Oh, I have a heart. Haven't you any romance in your soul? <laughs> At my age, they call it lumbago. Oh. 
Okay, I haven't seen you. But don't stick around too long. Thanks, Polly. You're a pal. When you hear the signal, the time will be 1.19 and three quarters. When you hear the signal, the time will be 1.20. When you hear the signal, the time will be 1.20 and one quarter. When you hear the signal, the time will be 1.20 and three quarters. We haven't got anyway. If that's the way you feel, Johnny, what you need is phone numbers. Lots of phone numbers. <laughs> When you hear the signal, the time will be 121. Hello. Is Miss Norton in? Yes. It's a nice day out for a drive, isn't it? Is it? Yes, I... Hello, Miss Norton. Hello, Johnny. Here's the statement you asked for on your savings account. Thanks. Come in a minute. I want to put some valuables in my vault. You going away? For a few weeks. Have you married your little telephone operator yet? No, I figured we could starve more comfortably on 40 a week than we could on 25. So we're waiting until I'm promoted from messenger to clerk. Gee, in a way I envy you kids. You envy us? Why, you're rich. You've got everything anyone could possibly want. Yes, I guess I have it that. See if you can open that thing. Certainly. No soap. Maybe you can pry it open. Oh, I hate to scratch that furniture. Oh, that's all right. The desk goes to the apartment. Go ahead. All right. Oh, you broke your knife. I'll buy a new one. Forget it. Pretty? Boy, oh boy. That's a beauty. I think I'll wear that. I'll certainly be careful of these. Yes, you'd better be. Thank goodness I'm bonded. Well, you run along now, and I'll meet you down to the bank in about an hour. Okay, Miss Norton. Thanks, Johnny. Bye. So long. Operator. This is Miss Norton's apartment. Could you give me the time? Yes, sir. It's uh, 1.40. Say, we better get together on this. My watch says 2 o'clock. It does? Well, this darn clock must be wrong again. Give me an outside line. I'll get the correct time. You stay on the wire. Yes, sir. When you hear the signal, the time will be 2 o'clock. Did you hear that, operator? Yes, sir. You were right. It's 2 o'clock. What's all the excitement? Calling the police. I heard a shot in 205. Police department, send an officer up to the Normandy apartments right away, quickly. Somebody's been shot. Four. Cars 17 and 24. A murder at the Normandy apartments. Flashlights. Now look, miss. Concentrate. 
What kind of voice did you hear on the phone? A man's voice. <laughs> <laughs> nice going, Collins. With clues like that, do you think we may predict an arrest within 24 hours? I got all the clues I need. She gave me a description of the bird that was up here. I got part of the net desk with, and I've got his fingerprints. Then all you need is the guy himself. And I'll get him. <laughs> Put that in an eight-column headline. <laughs> now, you wise guy out of here, let me do a little work. That's all, miss. She wants to do a little work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like a straight bakery job to me. Just sing. She caught him and he bumped her off. Ah, that Collins. A... Well, if it isn't Barney Callahan. Hello, Barney. What detained you, Barney? You must be getting out of the edition once a week. <laughs> he doesn't mind being scooped. City editor's the one who cares. Pepper, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we're being ripped. Oh. Stand aside, amateurs. Another couple of real news. <laughs> Hmm, and who is this morsel of luscious femininity? Say, don't get uh, too fresh. This mental giant is the operator who heard the murderer's voice on the telephone and can't remember what he sounded like. Oh, I'll see you later, honey. Okay, I'll be right downstairs. Thank you, thank you, and if they're any good, I'll make you a special price on a dozen. <laughs> I mean, to be late, Collins. Hope we didn't inconvenience you any. Oh, I've managed somehow. What is it, murder or suicide? Just a little matter of housebreaking and murder. But that wouldn't interest you. You're right, it wouldn't. But it has a fatal fascination for the Chronicle's 1,239,000 readers. So, give me the story, will you? If you want the news, you get here when the rest of them do. And stop looking for clues. I'm not looking for clues. I'm hunting for a match. Got a light? Thanks, Collins. You know, she was a very considerate girl, getting herself murdered just in time for the final audition. Snapper, get out off of there. You'll have the fingerprints all mixed up with footprints. Yeah, and Collins couldn't tell them apart. Come on, be a pal. You wouldn't want to see me get scooped, would you? If you'd keep on your toes, you wouldn't always be under my feet. Now get out of here. No, but Collins... You heard me. That goes for you, too. Hold it. Let's have a smile. Thank you. Uh, Come on. After this, stay away from them swinging doors. Maybe you'll get here on time. Come on, Collins. I gotta have a story. Oh, I had the sergeant phone your paper and cover for you. Now get down and talk to that dumb phone girl. Maybe she can give you a lead. Great guy, Collins. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll wait. Are you sure you told us everything? If I've forgotten anything, I don't remember what it is. Are you sure that man called the time signal operator? Sure, I'm sure. Why? Oh, nothing. Only I'm, I'm sort of crazy about her. <laughs> that is, vocally speaking. He fell in love with her voice one night when we were timing an execution. Yes, I'm waiting. Now he spends all his nickels calling her up to listen to a read time signal. I'll bet you still don't know what time it is. When you hear the crash, the, the time will be four o'clock. <laughs> Hello, City Desk. This is Barney. Here's a description of the man who went upstairs before the murder. A description? Well, that's fine. It may interest you to know that while you're letting a police sergeant do your work for you, we got a flash from headquarters that they've caught the murderer with $100,000 worth of Peggy Norton's jewelry on him. A prowl car picked him up over in front of the phone company. Well, that's that. What? What do you mean I'm rushing my deadline? I'm right on it. It's 4 o'clock. Okay. I'll see you in the morning. Your clock's 20 minutes fast, honey. Oh, that darn thing. First it's 20 minutes slow, then it's 20 minutes fast. Well, you better start it right or you get mixed up in your date tonight. I haven't a date tonight. Oh, that's tough. Max says we can go home. Aren't we going to solve the mystery? It's already solved. They picked up the murderer. Caught him with the goods. 100,000 bucks worth of jewelry. Where did all that come from? <laughs> If you will think back to just two minutes ago and stretch that remarkable brain of yours, you'll remember that you told us. Come on, Snapper. I'll bet you couldn't get a wrong number right. Hey! Yeah. Haven't you forgotten something? <laughs> yeah. Your camera, you dope. Bill! Bills. The first of the month, and all yours. Meridian, seven, one, two, one, two. When you have a signal, the time will be five, seven. Just a moment. Oh, but I want to listen to my dream girl. Aren't you forgetting something? No. Well, today is Monday. This is your week to be a valid. Very good, sir. You know, 
I was a little worried this afternoon. I was afraid we were in for another all-night investigation. Murder is a messy thing, if I may say so, sir. It interferes with one's family life, sir. <laughs> well, having no family myself, I'm no judge. All I know is I'm glad we're not going to spend the night chasing police cars. My robe. Oh, very good, sir. His robe. I'm getting exactly my old age, sir. Ah. And now, my trombone. Very good. What again? Yes. Very bad, sir. Say, have you been monkeying around with my phonograph needles again? Well, just to tack up a couple of pictures. Now look, and for the last time, will you lay off the ones with the white bands on them? I use those for playing my home recordings. And if you must tack up pictures, use the plain ones. Very good, sir. Hey, by the way, where were we for lunch today? We weren't. That's what I thought. And how would you like your hamburger, sir? At once. And perhaps with a crovne and a bit of a gooseberry tart? him about? Well, I have a story for him. A sob story? Yeah. You see, there was a man... Why, the brute, come on in! Oh. Barney, here's a little lady with a broken heart. Yeah, what's the matter? Are you Barney Callahan? Sure. Well, Judge Clemens of the Domestic Relations Court sent me. He said you could help me if you'd only print my story. Hmm. Lost your husband or something? Well, if, if I could just talk to you alone... Uh, sure. Okay. I can take a hint. Now you sit right over there and tell me all about it. <laughs> now don't be so upset. Things can't be as bad as they seem. Now then. So you're Barney Callahan. Of course. Well, I've got something for you, Mr. Callahan. From Judge Clemens? Oh, no, I, I made a slight mistake. Judge Clemens didn't send me here. But did you ever hear of Judge O'Brien? Of the small claims court? Right. And that's where you're going to be sued. Now, I'm from the Acme Collection Agency, and I want $15, which you owe the Etude Music Store on that trombone. <laughs> nice work, honey. You had me fooled there for a minute. Well, you haven't got me fooled. $15, please. What if I haven't got it? Excuse me for interrupting, but I want to call my dream girl. You'd make a great mistake taking this into court. Why, I've known Judge O'Brien for years. Yes, I suppose you are always being gone, Ashid. You surely wouldn't stifle genius by depriving my soul of a means of expression. All I want to deprive you of is $15. When you hear the signal, the time will be 5, 10 and 3 quarters. Do I get the money or do I take the trombone? Neither one. But I'll tell you what, I, I hate to think of you coming up here for nothing, so why don't you stay and have some hamburg with us? Not me. The butcher would probably repossess it. Now listen, be still. What a voice. It thrills every thread of my being. Look out you don't come unstitched. When you have a signal, the time will be 5.11 and one quarter. Hey, Barney! Listen to this. She's crying. Maybe she heard your voice. Come on, come on. Stop stalling. Who shot? When you hear the signal, the time will be... I can't stand it any longer. I can't stand it. <laughs> operator! Operator! What's the matter? Come on, get out of that monkey outfit. That sounds like a story. A story! Oh. A story! That's just the stall. Oh, use your imagination, sister. Now there's a girl, the voice of time, sitting there tolling off the seconds to a city of five million people. Suddenly she breaks out crying. Now how do we know what caused that? What's her secret sorrow? Who ruined her life? Why, the cat, I'll kill him. Wait a minute. 
Just where do I come in? Oh, you don't come in at all, sister. You go out. Oh, you take your hands off of me, you big gorilla. I'm gonna get off this easy. Can you please go collect your bills? I got work to do. So have I, and you're it. Get that money. Okay, honey, but you better hold on to your hat. <laughs> this, it'll steady your nerves. I'll be all right, Polly, thanks. If he only hadn't come back here to see me, it's all my fault. Oh, no. Oh, Polly didn't do it. He didn't. Now, dear, why don't you go home and you feel better, huh? Thanks, Polly. It's well up. Yes. Come on. Now, don't you worry. Everything's going to be all right. I'll punch out for you. I wish you'd stay downstairs in the cab. So you can leave by the alley entrance? Uh-uh. Oh, excuse me, are you the supervisor? Well? I'm a reporter, and I take his pictures. Oh. Well, the girl you want to see has gone home. Gone? Yes, and I have nothing to say. Oh, but just a minute, ma'am. I said I had nothing to say. Oh, but you don't understand. We only want to help the girl. How could a newspaper story help? Well, we... Uh, uh, suppose we leave that to you. Well, come into my office. Helen's a brave kid. She tried to go on working after Johnny was arrested, but, well, you heard what happened. And you say Johnny came directly here from Miss Norton's apartment? Yes, to wait for Helen. Some cops, officers, recognized his car and picked him up. Well, I don't know very much about murders, but the way you explain this one to me, there's something strange about the whole case. Yes. If Johnny was the murderer, why did you want the girl on the hotel switchboard to hear him call Meridian 71212? Why did he dial the time operator at all? Well, if we knew the answers to that, we'd know the answers to a lot of things. Say, maybe it was a triangle. He wanted his sweetheart to hear him kill the other girl. Helen couldn't have heard. The time signal girls have no way of knowing whether anyone's on the line or not. They call the time every 15 seconds regardless. You hear them, but they can't hear you. Then the only one who heard anything was the phone girl on the hotel switchboard. Much of eyes. Come on. Some clock shot that. I did. Why? Oh, it's uh, it's beautiful composition. <laughs> Very good. It's lovely. She never would have talked if it hadn't been for you. Thanks, honey. Oh, skip it. I just did it to get you out of there in a hurry. Now about my 15 bucks. Oh, sure, sure. You'll get it. Now look, I'm going over to headquarters to interview Johnny. What I want you to do Listen, is... Listen, if you want to sweep gutters with a pencil, that's your business. But I'm a bill collector. But you butted into this and you've got to help me. I want you to grab a cab. I'm not grabbing anything but money for that trombone. All right, all right, but I can't pay you for the trombone until I go home, and I can't go home until I get the story, and I can't clear up the story unless you cooperate. I seem to see you riding in a taxi. You're positively psychic. I'm positively insane. Well, all right, where's the cab there? Put it on my bill. Now, here's Helen Thomas's address. I want you to go over and talk to her. Get the girl's side of the story. You know, sobs, tears. Steal a picture if you can. Oh, I don't know how. Bring it over to my apartment, and I'll pay you for the trombone. Come on, snapper. I should have gone on relief while I had the chance. So you take $100,000 worth of Peggy Norton's jewelry and go to meet your girl? I told you before I was going down to meet Miss Norton an hour later at the bank. Then why didn't you go to the bank? That's where I was going, but I stopped off to see Helen. Hey, what about that girl, Captain? Maybe I'd better pick her up. No, you can't do that. She doesn't know a thing about it. Just suppose you tell me what you know. What about that man you told me you saw coming out of the apartment? Did you recognize him? I never saw him before. I'll bet you didn't. You didn't even see him then. Collins, you're shot here again. Now, Bonnie, you get out of here. Is that a nice way to act when I come bringing gifts? A picture of you in action. Now, that's real news. Is this the fiend in human form? That's how the dame looked after you killed her. Pretty, ain't it? Now, come clean. I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. Hey, where's the diamond clip? What diamond clip? The one she was wearing. She took it out of the jewel case and put it on a coat before I left. The jewelry we're interested in is the stuff you had on you. Sit down. <laughs> Do you really want him to talk? I wouldn't mind. Then let me handle it. The trouble with you is you don't know how to win friends and influence people. Just how would you do it, mastermind? Appeal to his emotions. Leave it to me. Go ahead. Hey, Carlos, make this guy smile, will you? Lay off of him, Snapper. He's been bulldozed enough. Ah. Would you like a cigarette? Thanks. I was just over the telephone company to see Helen. Can you fix it so I can see you? Yes, I suppose I could if you'd cooperate a little first. Why did you go to that apartment? I've already told them. I was sent there with a statement of Miss Norton's bank account. I see. Who sent you? 
My uncle, Philip Gregory. He's president of the bank where I work. Anybody else know he sent you? Why, I don't know. Ever been there before? Sure, lots of times. Always on business? Of course. Hey, wait right, a minute. Take it easy. Collins, if I were you, I'd talk to Gregory. Oh, you would. Well, I already have. Gregory says he doesn't know anything about it. Now, you come clean. I'm getting... You can't up. make me admit anything I didn't do. Nobody can sure try. If it's all right with you, I'd like to continue my investigation my own way. Now, get out of here. Keep your chin up, kid. Let me get a picture of you when you're nice and happy, will you? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this murder's killing me. <laughs> Where do we go now? To have a little talk with Mr. Gregory. All right. Hey, Barney. Oh, hello, Dad. Hiya, fella. Hi. Hello, Snapper. Hiya. Hey, Hi. looks bad you coming out of the bail clerk's office. What have they knocked you over for this time? I ain't been knocked over in six months. It's Eddie here. He got an argument with a cop. Bad <laughs> habit, Eddie. No cop has taken a punch at me. <laughs> What's the matter? Do you bruise easily? Listen, you. Lay off, Eddie. What are you doing down here, Bonnie? Oh, a little digging in the Peggy Norton murder. Oh, yeah. I heard about that case. I thought Collins had the guy who did it. Maybe, but it's always a pleasure to prove that Collins is wrong if I can. I wish you lots of luck, Bonnie. Remember, any time I can do anything for you, just let me know. Say, how's chances of playing another trombone solo down in your silver club? <laughs> Ain't he a great guy? Any time you say, kid. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dutch. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. I want to get a picture of his honest face. <laughs> there you are. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wait a minute. Ah, that bulk was hot. Oh, forget it, will you? You know Snapper's always kidding. There ought to be more reporters like Barney Callahan. I've heard of snoopers getting their noses cut off, sticking them into other people's business. Not Barney's a pal of mine. He did me a favor one time. I was just thinking. Maybe he ain't been with us long enough to find out that I do the thinking. Third, they have absolutely no evidence. Not a bit, except that he had the broken knife. He left fingerprints all over the desk. And when they caught him, he had the jewelry. Of course, if Johnny went there on legitimate business, a good lawyer could shoot the case full of holes. The boy says you sent him, and the police say you deny it. The police are right. But I didn't know anything about it until after the arrest. That makes things look pretty bad for the kid. Oh, I can't understand what possessed him. Of course, he used to get into little difficulties in college, bad checks, a debt or two, but, but nothing really serious. Won't you join me? Thank you. I took Johnny into the bank to straighten him out and give him a sense of values. Some people are just born dishonest. Kicking up your heels in college is a little different from murder. Maybe one of your assistants sent him and quoted the order is coming from you. I thought of that possibility, of course, especially as I was away from the bank most of the afternoon. But I checked up. Nobody sent him out. Johnny went there on his own. Well, that puts a period at the end of the sentence instead of a question mark. Will you have your attorneys defend him? Certainly I will. Well, thank you, Mr. Gregory. Let me get a picture of you smiling. No, no, you? please. I... Oh, thank you. Stop it. Oh, he was a beauty. He was just ready to go for it. Are you Helen Thomas? Yes. Well, I'm Margie Roth of the Chronicle. Oh, please come in. I thought probably my paper could help you by printing the real news about Johnny Martin. Oh, thank you. And you can help me a lot if, if you'll just... Won't you sit down? Thanks. I'm awfully glad you came. I did so want to talk to someone. Have you seen Johnny? No, I haven't. But, but I suppose you have. No, I was down there, but they wouldn't let me in. What are they doing to him? Is he all right? Of course he's all right. He's... You don't think he killed her, do you? Well, I... If you knew Johnny like I do, you'd know he didn't. He couldn't. Why, Johnny's a sweet kid. And you love him a lot, don't you? We've been sweethearts ever since we were children. You see, we used to live upstate in Oswego. When he finished college and came to New York to work, I came here too. So he can get married. As soon as he's making enough money. But now... Oh, you're not the first kids to come to New York and have their dreams turn into nightmares. Haven't you any friends here? No, that's the trouble. If only I knew somebody. If I just had someone to help me. Now oh, everything looks so hopeless. Here, here, keep your chin up. You have to fight. How can I fight a whole police department? Well, you think Johnny's innocent, don't you? Of course. Then there must be some way of proving it. Had Johnny been to Peggy Norton's before? Lots of times. Did you know her? Sure. We both thought she was pretty nice. Let me show you something. When she heard we were engaged, she gave us this. Oh, isn't it lovely? 
beautiful. With sterling silver. She was nice to you. This cost her at least $200. Well, money didn't mean a thing to her. No, I guess not. Did Johnny ever mention seeing any other men at her apartment? No. The uh, reporter said that she wasn't married, but someone must have been there. MPR and Sons, why? I'm going to find out if anybody was paying Peggy Norton's bills. But how can you do that? Why, I'm a collector. A collector? Uh, yes, a, a collector of news items. Can you hear the signal? The time will be 7.59 and 1.40. Barney! I've got an idea. That's fine. You've also ruined a home recording of a first-class trombone solo. Oh. What did you find out? That Johnny Martin's innocent. Scoop down your first assignment. He's guilty. I talked to his uncle and the boy's lying. Listen to me, Barney Callahan. That kid didn't do it and, and you're going to prove he didn't. Oh, I am. How? Well, I've got a hunch. Peggy Norton may have been killed by a man who got tired of paying her bills. Now, if she was, his name's probably in these records. What's all this stuff? Her credit record. The Retail Credit Association has a complete file of every charge account in town. Now, if somebody owes a bill and someone else is paying it, there's a card index file on it. Maybe she was killed by an angry creditor. He slapped her a little too hard with a subpoena. How did you get all this dope? A friend of mine, assistant manager of the association. Sweetheart, you have the instincts of a true reporter. Here, we'll check this list of bills against the dates paid. Lacey's dress shop, March the 9th, $2,000. Paid May 1st in cash. Well, that doesn't help. Empire and Sons Jewelers, May the 4th, $6,000. Paid June 1st in cash. Hey, let's see some of those. She seemed to have a habit of paying her bills in cash. Barney ought to try that once in a while. Well, there's one thing clear. Somebody's afraid to put his name on a check. Here's the name, J.E. Moran. Look, he paid a bill at the Parkway Liquor Store with a check. J.E. Moran. Hey, Barney, that's Dutch. Yeah. Dutch Moran, the racketeer? Yeah. He's just the kind of rat that would pull a trick like that. We'll take this to the police. Oh, no, he won't. Why not? Are you nuts? No, take a look at that. got nice friends. Oh, Barney, you can't lay off just because he's a pal of yours. Who said I'm going to lay off? All I said is we're not going to the police, not just yet. Come on, Snapper, get your hat. Come on, come on. And I was all set for a nice quiet evening at the telephone. See you later, dearie. If you're right about that, it means the end of a swell friendship. Well, it's all in a day's work. Oh, that reminds me. How about the $15 for the trombone? <laughs> well, this is all I've got. It's five bucks. Well, that'll do for a start. Let's go. Oh, you can't come with us. We've got to do some investigating of those bills of Peggy Norton's. And, uh, I'm sticking right on the trail of that little bill of yours until it's paid. Okay, honey. And I was going to put a roast in the oven. I want to know is whether Dutch man was in the habit of paying Peggy Norton's liquor bills. I couldn't say. Aren't you Barney Callahan? Why, yeah. You're a friend of Dutch's, ain't you? Of course. We're pals of his. Then why don't you ask him? Say, do you know who you're talking to? Sure, I ain't talking to nobody. There is not a soul here, is there? Now I know what the police mean when they say they're up against a blank wall. You're beginning to find out how the other half of the world lives. Say, if you were a detective and you were baffled, what would you do? Gee, I don't know. What would you do? Oh, now, wait a minute. He asked you first. Come on, I'll show you. Dutch ain't here. Then you better find him quick and tip him off. Barney Callahan was just in here with the dame. They found out about Dutch and Peggy. Okay. I'll take care of it. Barney Callahan's out to hang the Norton killing on Dutch. Yeah? Well, that's gone a little too far, even for a pal. That's what I think. Come on. Please find out you came up here. I don't know, but I'm in favor of keeping it a secret. Well? Look around some more, and if you find anything that leads to Dutch Moran, holler. 
Let's go in here. Gee, she certainly knew how to spend money. <laughs> That's easy enough to learn. You ought to know. must have shrunk. You know, I can't figure out why the murderer wanted the girl on the switchboard downstairs to hear the time. That's trying to prove they were somewhere else when the murder was committed. Yeah, but, but why would he try to prove he was here at 2 o'clock? With a voice like hers couldn't be mixed up in a murder. I think I'll listen to her for a while. My nerves are all on edge. Lay off that phone. You want to get in trouble with the police? Someday I'm going to make a record of her voice. And I can listen to it on cold winter nights. A record? Say, look at this needle. The last record played on here was a home recording. Maybe she played a trombone, too. <laughs> yeah, or maybe the murderer wanted an alibi. Here. When he shot Peggy Norton, he made the operator here believe it happened at 2 o'clock by playing a home recording of the wrong time, after making sure that the operator downstairs remained on the wire. Now all you've got to do is find the records. Sashay la femme! <laughs> but if the girl downstairs dialed Murdy in 712... Yeah, but she didn't. The man up here asked for an outside line. And instead of dialing it, he simply played his record. Snap it when we find a man with a perfect alibi, we've got the murderer. Yeah. Where were you at 2 o'clock? Huh? Why, you know perfectly well. I, I was with you. Oh, they were both suspects. Well, it's gone. There's no homemade recording in the place. You don't think Dutch would leave evidence like that lying around, do you? Hardly, but I didn't think he'd kill Peggy Norton, either. What's the matter with you? Chew it, gum! Where'd you find it? Your cigarette fell on it. People shouldn't go around putting gum in ashtrays. A whole pack at a time. Apparently, Peggy Norton didn't know where Emily Post. That isn't Peggy Norton's chewing gum, but I think I know whose it is. Dutch Moran? And I'm going to tell him a thing or two or three about this. We're going to tell the police about this. No, but we can't. Not just yet. Oh, if I could only ask Dutch a few questions. Whether he admits knowing Peggy Norton, if he has a home recording of it, where he was at 2 o'clock. Well, why don't you just ask him? Because my blonde Sherlock, the proprietor of that liquor store, undoubtedly has tipped off Dutch that I'm out to get him. And he might kill you. Nah, he just wouldn't talk to me, that's all. Well, that puts little Margie right behind the eight ball as usual. Now, wait a minute. You can't talk to Dutch. Why can't I? He doesn't know me. I can go up there and ask him for a job, tell him I'm a friend of Peggy Norton's. Yeah, but suppose he gets the idea that you're a friend of mine. In that case, he won't give you the job. He'll give you the works bank. Oh. Look, if I can handle you, I can handle Dutch. I'll meet you at your place in an hour. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Thanks. But if I get in this much trouble over a trombone, I hope you never buy a pipe organ. So you want a job, huh? Yes, sir. Sing? Not very well. Dance? Oh, not professionally, no. Fans maybe, or bubbles? You see, Miss Moran, I, I'm not a professional entertainer, but I thought maybe you could use a good cigarette girl. I uh, peddle a mean cigarette. Let me see your legs. Hi, move back. Turn around. Ooh. Yeah, you got a lot of class. Just what it takes. You're cute. You know, you don't look like a cigarette girl to me, though. Who sent you up here, anyway? Peggy Norton. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Poor Peggy. She was going to talk to you about me personally, and then that awful thing happened. She thought the world of you, you know. Hello, Lefty. What's the idea of busting in here? Sorry, Dutch, but I wanted to make sure you heard about Barney Callahan. What about him? Well, Let me go. Lay off of her. What's the matter with you, anyway? She was in my place with Barney. They're trying to hang the Norton killing on you. So you're a cigarette girl, huh? <laughs> All right, sister, come on. Oh, you can't do that. It's, it's kidnapping. Okay, sue me. <laughs> Hello, 
fellas. Are you looking for somebody? What do you think? I'm surprised at you, Blackie. Yeah, and I'm surprised at you. You shouldn't have tried to hang that Norton job on Dutch Barney. I'm awfully sorry, but we've got to take care of you. The landlady's going to be awful mad if you mess up the room. She, she just had it papered. I wouldn't think of spoiling the wallpaper. Go on downstairs. Okay. Hey, Barney, what do you mean by... Put that gun away. Put your hands down. Honest? What's the idea? Well, gee, Dutch, we, we just kind of figured that maybe Barney here was getting in your hair a little. Shut up. I told you Barney was a pal of mine. Yeah, a backslapper. He'll slap you right into the hot seat. If he does, it's my business. Where I come from, we don't take a murder rap laying down. Yeah, but this is the big town, and if you want to wait for me, I give the order, see? I'm sorry, Dutch. All right, I'll get out of here, both of you. I want to talk to Barney. You too, Blackie. You ain't sorry, boss. Get out of here. Much obliged, Dutch. Forget it. You two go outside and make some sandwiches or something. You heard me. How do you want yours? With or without rat poison? That dame's too fresh. Somebody ought to give her a slap right in the teeth. Listen, Barney. What's the idea of trying to frame me for murder? I'm not trying to frame you. I'm trying to convict you. That might not be so easy as you think. That might not be as hard as you think. How well did you know Peggy Norton? What makes you think I knew her at all? Oh, never mind, I found out. All right. We were pretty good friends, but that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Take a tip from me, Bonnie, and lay off this case. You know I never lift a finger to hurt you. But you saw how nervous my boys get sometimes. And I may not always be around when you need me. Where's your palsy wealthy? He's gone. And I made these with mayonnaise. You mean to say you let him get away? You could have held him here and called the police. Sure, and before they got him to headquarters, his mouthpiece would be there with a writ of habeas corpus. There's one thing more I've got to do before I go to the DA. Snapper, get your dream girl on the phone. Oh, that's me. Here she is. What are you doing? Shh. When you hear the signal, the time will be 10.15 and one quarter. If it was Dutch, I'm going to use this to prove that I'm wise to his alibi. But you've got all the evidence you need. Why don't you just turn everything over to the police and call his clothes? It's no fun to pin a murder on a man that's been your friend for years. I know that, Bonnie, but there's not much else you can do. Well, I've enjoyed tonight, even though I have been insulted, threatened, kidnapped and almost murdered. Now, if you'll give me the other $10, I'll go on home. <laughs> so you're back on the main line of that one-track mind of yours. Mm -hmm. Snapper, if you have $10, give it to this lady, Shylock. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, wait a minute. Nine, six, And there's seven, five, eight, five, nine, five, nine, six, nine, seven, nine, eight. I think going up. I'll put in my two cents worth and make up the deficit. Well, that's certainly white of you. And remember, if you ever want to collect it from him, I'll do it for 25 percent. Said it's pretty steep, isn't it? Well, goodbye. Goodbye, honey. It's been nice owing you. And thanks for the legwork. What? Well, that's newspaper talk for the way you've been chasing clues all evening. <laughs> Is uh, thanks all I get? No. If you ever miss me, here's a home recording of one of my trombone solos. Just a song at twilight and B-flat. And here's something extra special. Thanks. You're very generous. Oh, and thanks for the ten dollars. Say, Marge. Huh? I got a souvenir for you, too. Save it for your dream girl. I almost went the way of all flesh. Come on, Snapper, get your hat. What, again? Yeah, we're going to pay Dutch a little visit. Oh, no! Oh, every man for himself when they start popping these pop things. The rights. I'm afraid I have, Dutch. Where were you at 2 o'clock this afternoon? Down at headquarters making bail for Eddie. I stayed there till after 6 o'clock while he checked on his record. You ought to know you saw me coming out. Break down that alibi. No, I'll take your word for it. 
But I am going to prove you went to headquarters from Peggy Norton's apartment, where you killed her at 20 minutes to 2. And used a recorded time signal to alibi that she was killed at 2 o'clock. And headquarters is just a nice 15-minute drive from Peggy's apartment. Who asked you? This is how you fooled that dumb operator. <laughs> I do serenade with a trombone before I kill her? <laughs> you must have given Margie the wrong record. See if there's a phone listed under Margie Ross. If there is, get her. And tell her to bring that record right up here. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> record or no record? You killed Peggy Norton. I found out you've been paying some of her bills. I haven't seen her in weeks. I can prove you were at her apartment this afternoon. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> we found this gum in an ashtray. And you're the only one I know who chews a whole pack at a time. Nobody likes a murder rap, Bonnie. That's why I didn't spill everything to you before. I was up to her place today. I didn't kill her, but I think I know who did. I'm listening. Have you ever a man named Gregory? Gregory? Johnny Martin's uncle? Yeah, that's the guy. How do you know? Well, Peggy liked to play the horses. She used to place bets in my office downtown. She lost plenty. A thousand here, two or three there, and Gregory was always the guy who paid me. Go on. Well, yesterday she plunged and dropped 10,000. When I went to her place to collect today, she didn't have the money. Said that Gregory refused to pay off on any more of her bets. And that they'd had a row about it. Do you have any of his checks? No. He always paid in cash. Can you prove any of this? No, I can't. I'm sorry, Dutch. I, I don't believe you. I'll have to turn in my evidence. Wait a minute. Suppose Gregory confesses. Fine chance of that. Maybe there is. Margie isn't there. Nobody answers the phone. Bonnie, will you do me a favor? Give me a little time before you go to the DA. Sure, Dutch. Why? Blackie will take you to my place at the lake and I'll meet you there in an hour. Hey, Blackie. I said we're going for a ride. You'll never get away with this, Dutch. This is a... Call it anything you want. Now get your hat and let's get out of here. All right. Have you seen Barney Callahan? He just left with Blackie. Blackie? Wasn't Dutch with them? No, but they were going to meet him. Oh, Mr. Callahan gave me this by mistake, and I've got to get it to him. Where are they going to meet Dutch? I don't know, but he left word he wanted his car later. Much obliged. Careful this doesn't explode. We don't want any accidents. I thought Dutch wouldn't stand for anything like this. Yeah, I'm cutting loose from that guy. That's why I called you. Now you're getting smart. How about that truck? It leaves a Madison bank at 10 minutes to 12. It carries 50,000 smack as a payroll for upstate. And only three guards. It's a cinch. Come here, you. Ah! Come here. Let me go. Let me out of here. Oh, no, you don't. You know this dame? I'll say I do. She's Bonnie Callahan's stupid. Oh, yeah? I'll have you arrested. That's what you think. Drive up an alley and I'll get rid of it. Later, we gotta step on it now. Come on, let's get going. If I pull the ring on this firecracker, it might go off. Pull that bag out here. Come on, throw it out. Get your hands up. There, you. Keep them up. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Be on the lookout for a black sedan. License 4X382. Containing two men and a woman. These people are wanted for an armor truck stick-up. They're armed. Exercise caution.
ring. Throw it out the window. But, but isn't it a bomb or something? Sure. But it'll explode. I hope so. Go on, I'll do as I said. No. Go on, hurry up. Get back. Come on, get out of there. Put your foot on that seat. All right, now, put your other arm up. Now, push yourself out. Come on, get going. Oh, leave me alone. Come on, get going. I killed Peggy Norton. That's the most absurd thing I ever heard of. When I talked to you this afternoon, you didn't even tell me you knew her. But you didn't ask me. Purely an oversight. The fewer corners you cut, the sooner we'll get this over with. I refuse to be intimidated like this. Sure, now suppose you tell Barney about the row you and Peggy had last night. But that had nothing to do with the case. Didn't you tell you were running short of dough? But look here. Relax. You told you wouldn't pay off any more of our bets, too. If you think I'm She told me all about it this morning when I went to a place to collect on a $10,000 she dropped yesterday. Am I right? Yes, you're right. But you're not going to make me confess to a crime I didn't commit. Maybe you'll tell me about one you did commit. I've nothing more to say, and that's final. I'll give you just 30 seconds, and then I'm going to get tough. Where were you at 2 o'clock this afternoon? At my dentist, Dr. Stone, 5th Avenue and 42nd Street. Say, he's the fellow with the perfect alibi, trapped by an aching bicuspid. What time did you reach your dentist? Five minutes to two. And Peggy Norton lives at 39th and Park Avenue. He had just time to make it. If you're stalling, Gregory, don't. Because I know all about that phonograph record. The one that gave the murderer 20 minutes time to set up an alibi. He doesn't want to talk, Bonnie. He'd rather have a hot foot without any shoes on. All right, all right. I, I did have a quarrel last night with Peggy. And then you made up your mind to kill her. I decided that days ago. We've been quarreling for weeks. I wanted to break with her, but she wouldn't allow it. Oh, I, I'm in over my head in the market, and she knew it. She threatened to expose me. But if she had, it would have smashed the bank and sent me to prison. So I, I made up my mind to kill her. But you had to have an alibi, so you made that time signal record. Yes, I did. Two days ago at my apartment, I'd heard Johnny speak of his fiancée, and she, being a time signal operator, gave me the idea. Now then, let's have the truth about Charlie. You did send him up there, didn't you? Yes. I told him to be there at 1.30. You deliberately framed him on a murder rap? I've met up with a lot of first-class grade A rats, but... Yeah. All right, you sent him up there, then what? I took the record up to Peggy's apartment. Shortly after Johnny arrived, how did you get in? The door to the study was unlocked. And after Johnny left, you pulled your time signal gag? Yes. And then you shot Peggy Norton? No, I didn't! Now, don't give us that. Oh, Dutch, give him a hot foot. But as true as I'm sitting here, I didn't kill her. That's a fine bedtime story. You make elaborate preparations for an alibi. You frame your own nephew. You go to her apartment and sneak in. And then you spring your phony time signal on the operator downstairs and you say you didn't kill her. Say, maybe she killed herself, you know, so he would take the rap. I'm a pretty patient guy, Gregory, but if you think I'm gonna go for a yarn like that... Oh, I can't help what you believe. It's the truth. She was in the next room. I just played the record when I heard a shot. I opened the door a little and saw her lying there on the floor. And there was a man just running out of the room. Now listen. It's the truth. Take me to the police and I'll tell them everything. What if you are telling the truth? The fact that you went there with a the gun makes you guilty of assault, with intent to commit murder. Under the state law, that's a felony. I don't care. What about your nephew? Oh, I still have a little money left. I'll make it up to him. You're lying, Gregory. You know you killed Peggy Norton yourself and... <coughs> like you see who that is. <coughs> you keep your mouth shut, you won't get hurt. Who lives here? Nobody. Boys come up here when they need a little vacation. It's Eddie with a blonde. I'll take care of him. Judge! What are you doing here? Barney! I held up a bank and, and threw dynamite in there. There were cops and, and robbers and... Oh. You snapper. What's she talking about? 
Who held up a bank? Who shot you? That's my business. That's the man. Don't oh, get excited. What's he talking about? That's the man who killed Peggy Norton. I saw him. What do you know about this? He held up an armored truck and, and his partner was killed and, and there's the money. How do you know? Well, I was with them. A game ball. So you pull a heist, huh? What's the idea of coming up to my place anyway? I didn't know anybody was here. I was only going to hide out. But I hadn't been for that dumb cluck. Never mind about the holdup. Where did you get this? I found it on a Christmas tree. That's the diamond brooch I gave to Peggy. Then it's the one she was wearing when Johnny left her apartment. Dutch, it's the cops. Stolen, Dutch, stolen. You gotta give me a chance to get away. Not on your life. You got a nerve coming up here anyway. <laughs> Don't move anybody. Stay where you are. Take it easy, Dutch. How'd he get that gun, Blackie? Well, he grabbed it from me. Where is he? He went out the window. I'll take care of him. Wait a minute, fellas. It was Eddie Morelli. He went out the window. Come on, follow me. Get him, boys. Not yet. He nearly got me. Much obliged. No, we didn't do it. It was Dutch. Dutch? Dutch! Oh, I'm sorry, Dutch. Forget it. Give me a cigarette, will you? Sure. Here. I told you I didn't do it. Yeah. <coughs> you got him off. We'll get you to a hospital right away. Get him out of here, Sergeant, will you? Brady. Come here, Miller. Mr. Gregory wants to tell you about some shortages at his bank. An acute little idea he thought up to commit a murder. Don't you? Yes. Well, that's fine. Tell him I was asking about him, will you? Thanks. They've just operated on Dutch and removed the bullet. But that's a load off his mind. The doctor says it'll be as good as new in a month. Well, surprise. Why, you're just in time for a snack of lunch. Would you have a, uh, a crepe Suzette or some champignon sous... Uh... Uh, clash? Yeah. Did you see this? I wrote it. I was over at the hospital just before Eddie died. So he was Peggy Norton's jailbird husband. Yeah, he told me the whole story. He was paroled about a month ago, looked her up, found her sitting pretty, and decided to blackmail her. And she wouldn't come through. Well, she couldn't. She'd lost all her cash on the races. Yeah, all she had left was $100,000 in diamonds. She was practically on relief. Eddie went to see Peggy yesterday afternoon and said he'd settled for the jewelry. She told him to go roll a hoop the stuff was in the bank. So he killed her, took the diamond clip, and beat it. Have we enough for her? I'll water the soup. Well, I hope you boys enjoy your new home. Why? We're not going to move. Oh, yes, you are. If you can dig up a month's rent on a nice furnished apartment. What's the matter with this place? You're being sued by the credit furniture company. I seem to hear the familiar howl of the wolf at the door. And here's a writ of repossession on the table, the chairs, the rugs, the kitchen furniture, the bed, and the Davenport. You forgot the bathtub. Come on in, boys. A pair of wolves! Hold it, fellas. I want to get a picture. All right, now smile, smile pretty. Come on, give me a thing and watch the birdie. Now hold it, hold it. Thank you, thank you. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, Barney, Barney. Oh, come on, put me down, will you, fellas? You remember me, I'm the kid with the drum. <laughs> I was a little tired of my own furniture anyway. Sure, I know how you feel. A person likes to change every once in a while. Margie, I, I suppose it's a heck of a time to bring it up, but I was wondering if you could go for a guy that likes to play the slide trombone. Oh, I could stand your music, Barney. I might even be able to stand you, but I couldn't stand anything like this. But I learned to play the trombone. Maybe I could learn to pay my bills. Well, if you do, give me a ring. I'll be around somewhere. Goodbye. Oh. 
Do you mind if I take your picture? Do you know how to work it? Sure. Hey, that's my camera. You can't take that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh, how I hate a practical joke. <laughs> I'm Randall Schaefer. You see me hosting Hastings Mystery Theater here on the Hastings Cable Channel. Hastings Mystery Theater is produced for the local cable channel in Hastings, Michigan, USA. We are rated as one of the best 100 small towns in America, Hastings, Michigan. Look us up on the internet. Take a look at some of the reasons we are one of the best hundred small towns in America. And maybe you'll see why those of us who live here really like living in Hastings, Michigan. And also, continue to watch Hastings Mystery Theater here on YouTube. Post your comments, like, and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>